podcasting monthly from the shores of the Delaware River in Trenton, New Jersey. This is Tech NJ, powered by NJOIT, the New Jersey Office of Information Technology. Follow and listen to discussions on a variety of tech issues, trends, and topics with industry leaders and up and coming influencers to find where technology meets public service in New Jersey. Hello, and welcome to Tech NJ. I'm your host, John Silvestri. Computer viruses have been around almost as long as computers have, threatening everything from decreased performance to widespread theft of personal data. Worms, Trojans, boot sector viruses, viruses in documents, viruses in image files, viruses on websites. Typically, when we hear about a virus or malware, it usually involves a security breach where data gets leaked out to some nefarious party. That party can then sell it or use it in whatever way they see fit. Recently, a new method of attack has been making the headlines. Instead of stealing data, this new form of attack threatens to destroy data unless the hacker's demands are met. This new method of attack has been dubbed ransomware and has affected home computers and large organizations alike. I have Krista Mazeo, Cyber Threat Intelligence Analyst for the NJ Cybersecurity Communications Integration Cell under the NJ Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. She is a certified ethical hacker and has a Master's of Science in Cybersecurity. Krista, thank you for joining us here today. Oh, thank you for having me. So what is ransomware? How does ransomware differ from all the other viruses that have plagued computer systems? Well, everyone's talking about ransomware now, but the down and dirty of it is that ransomware is a type of malicious software or malware that attempts to extort victims by restricting access to devices, computers, and files. So how does ransomware get in? Does ransomware act like a normal virus to get in, or does it have a special avenue? Well, I I started looking into ransomware about a year and a half to two years ago. I had heard the term, and I found it kind of interesting and and cleverly evil. So, of course, it fascinated me. So I started looking into the different types of variants, and uh, they all act and perform a little differently. A common attack vector is through malicious emails or emails that contain malicious attachments or links that lead to malicious or compromised websites. That's a primary attack vector that we've seen, you know, the start of last year, the past year, year and a half. Another attack vector is through malvertising. Now, malvertising is kind of a shortened form of malicious advertising. So if I don't like advertising already, this is even worse. Exactly. Exactly. This is actually that, that added, you know, encouragement you need to run an ad blocker on your browser. What malicious advertising is is when you visit a website, a lot of news websites will have ads. The problem is they're not hosting the advertisements. They're actually going through third-party advertising networks, so they do not have control over the ads that get placed on their website. They just kind of cycle through. So hackers have actually attacked these uh, advertising networks and have replaced some of the ads with ads that host malicious code inside them, So when you go to visit a website that you might go to all the time and you've never had a problem with before, one day you'll visit it and all of a sudden you're infected. Not just with ransomware, it could be with other forms of malware too. You know, but then there's nothing that you've done wrong, essentially. I've seen some of these, they appear very intrusive and they also appear very alarming. You know, they'll pop up and say, your computer is infected with 10,000 viruses, download our software immediately, click OK right now or else everything's ruined. Like That's a little different. That's called scareware. Ah, And a lot of times, if if you've heard of adware that gets on your system or spyware, adware will pop up advertisements on your actual system. And and part of that, they'll try and get you to act. And they do that through social engineering, psychological manipulation. They'll try and scare you into thinking you have a big virus on your computer. They'll scare you into thinking that law enforcement has detected some type of illicit files on your machine and you need to pay in order to restore access and clean your system. If it's not associated with the antivirus software you're already running, then it's obviously scareware and you need to run a scan. Back to ransomware though. So, you know, no fault of my own, I get ransomware on my system somehow. How does it go about extorting me and my files? That's an interesting process. Typically, once you get infected, the executable, the ransomware, will run silently in the background. You probably won't pick up on anything if you're not looking for it. Although there are cases where it'll um, degrade system performance, depending on the system you have and the number of files. But it gets on your system a number of ways. It could be through a Trojan, a backdoor. It could be deployed manually through a remote desktop protocol compromise. Once it starts, it performs a number of functions. It'll try and do what's called maintaining persistence, which means it'll inject processes into, say, the registry and the startup. So even if you reboot your system, it's still running. Then it will search around for a bunch of different files that it wants to encrypt. Now, the developer of the ransomware kind of has control of that. 
So let's say we know a photography company, they'll have a lot of JPEGs. Well, if we target them, we're going to want to encrypt all their JPEGs because that's their, their bread and butter right there. But they typically go after uh, document files, Excel spreadsheets, PDFs, anything that the variant or the developer of the variant determines to be important that you pay to get back. After it does that, it will either propagate, it, it might look for other drives connected to your system or the network. It'll look for thumb drives, external hard drives, uh, network attached storage, mapped and unmapped network shares. It'll encrypt everything it finds there. When it's done, it alerts you. It's kind of unusual in that respect because other viruses, they might not alert you right away, especially if there's malware that's trying to steal your data. It's not gonna let you know that it's stealing your data. Ransomware goes, hey, we're gonna pop up a note. Guess what? Your files are locked. Uh, if you want them back, you're going to pay us X amount of Bitcoin in order to, to restore access. If you pay us, usually within a time frame, we'll send you a decryption key. Other ransomware variants have other uh, more nefarious functions where it'll have a countdown timer on the ransom note. If you don't pay within a certain amount of time, it threatens to delete your files or exfiltrate your data. So those are other considerations to so you get a message on your screen that says, I want 10 Bitcoin and you get all your files back. I'll send you a decryption key. What if, you know, I operate my phot photographer shop and I don't know anything about Bitcoin? You wouldn't be alone if that was the case, because there are a lot of people that have never heard of Bitcoin that suddenly know about Bitcoin and they suddenly know how to buy it because they had to figure it out. A lot of individuals, they'll call in tech professionals. And at this point, you know, your IT service guys is going to at least have heard about Bitcoin, if not conducted a transaction with it, they'll know about it. But typically the ransom note will give you instructions on what to do. And some ransomware variants actually have a customer service component. These Organized criminal groups that are behind some of these ransomware campaigns really want the victim to feel cared for, and they want to make sure they get their money. The, so they'll offer like a chat feature if you have any questions. They'll provide an email address to contact them if there's any kind of question. It, it's kind of fascinating to see, but there's a whole economy um, that's built up underneath this type of malware. That's impressive. Press one for customer service, press two to talk to a representative. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> the hackers don't like using the phone, so it's typically online. But um, but yeah, there'll be instructions on how to purchase the Bitcoin, which is the uh, relatively anonymous cryptocurrency that hackers use to conduct transactions. Right. And I'm assuming Bitcoin is harder to trace than, say, non-consecutive $20 bills or something along those lines. Well, if you're going to send money, you need some place to mail it to. You need to transfer it to a bank account, and that is easily traceable. Now, I'm not going to say Bitcoin is completely untraceable. That is not true, but it is a lot more difficult to trace Bitcoin than it is any other form of currency. So you conduct the transaction with the gentleman hackers here who have so graciously told you how to give them the money. They just give you the decryption keys and they go on their merry way. It's just a guaranteed it's not going to be. Yeah, I hope they do. That's not always the case. The criminal organizations that really have made a business out of it, I'd say nine times out of 10, they will send the decryption keys, or at least they intend to send them. In other fly-by-night operations or script kitties that get a hold of some ransomware code and deploy it, just once they have the money, they don't care. You know, they're gone, they'll infect the next person. So it, it's kind of a 50-50 chance you're taking after you pay. And the reason why I say that, not only does the hacker have the choice of sending you the decryption key or not, there are also a number of other things that can take place between the time that you submit payment and the time you'd get your key. Ransomware and the hackers behind it use what's known as a C2 server, or command and control server. That's pretty much where they deploy all their operations and, and they can you know, conduct their business. And it's typically not a server they own. It's either gonna be hosted on the dark web somewhere that can't be found. They might have hacked into somebody else's server or company's server and stealing their resources to host their server to conduct these transactions. Well, the problem is, is once, you know, if there's an IP address that's detected or a compromised server that's found, and if it's cleaned and wiped or law enforcement takes the C2 server offline, that communication channel is gone. So you can no longer get that key with the way some of the variants work. Uh, I've talked to a number of people who have paid and they've waited patiently for a key that never came. So then you still have your, your files are, are encrypted and uh, you're sitting there waiting for a key and you're out the money that you paid and the hacker's long gone. And it's safe to say that once a file is encrypted, if you don't have that decryption key, there's just like you can't put cycles, you know, toward decrypting a file just through brute force. There are a team of security researchers that I follow on Twitter that are the top of their game in ransomware. 
And they actually take it upon themselves and, and spend a lot of their free time creating free, publicly available decryption tools for some variants. What they'll do is they'll try and obtain a sample of the ransomware's executable. Once they have that, they'll reverse engineer it and they'll try and figure out if maybe the decryption key is hidden somewhere in the code or if they can crack it. If the encryption on that key is not that great, uh, sometimes they are able to crack it and they will actually post a link to uh, software you can use to decrypt your files. That is not guaranteed in every case and a lot of times it might take months between the time a ransomware variant is discovered and a decryption tool is released. Now, I've kind of made it my mission with the NJKIC. We have an extensive ransomware threat profile up on our website at uh, www.cyber.nj.gov. Currently, we're at 170 variants that I've done research on. Uh, I list how each of them works, what to look for, how you know if you're infected by that particular variant, as well as any free publicly available decryption tools that are available. Is this limited to computers? Is this just strictly servers, laptops, desktops? Nope. No? Nope. Is anything safe anymore? I can't. I? No. Uh, <laughs> throw, throw out all your technology. No. Oh. Um, primarily, it's computers. Primarily, uh, Windows operating system is targeted. It's the most widely used operating system, and that's why, you know, the hackers are casting a wide net and trying to catch as many victims as possible. Right. In and the widest net with the least effort. Yeah, exactly. Uh, however, we have seen uh, growth in the Android operating system, ransomware department. Android has been targeted. Some of their ransomware variants, they don't encrypt the files. It's more of a screen locker. You just can't use any function on your phone until you flash the ROM or something like that. Android seems to be easier to overcome Android uh, ransomware infections. A lot of times you just have to restore to factory settings or something along those lines. Well, there was a story just this past December where a guy had gotten a, a brand new smart TV for Christmas, and he set it up, and he uh, installed an application on it to stream some sort of movies or, or TV shows. That application was malicious. He did not know that, and when it was done installing, it popped up a ransom note on his TV screen. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wanted to watch usually TV, those <laughs> usually those come from the cable provider <laughs> exactly <laughs> popped it up and uh you know merry christmas to him he couldn't use it he ended up i think he returned it back to the store <laughs> that's well <laughs> but just think about all of the different devices that we now have connected to the internet and in fact the ransomware event that happened last weekend with a variant called WannaCry, there was a report that just came out today saying that there were medical devices that were impacted files on actual medical devices, uh, something connected to MRI uh, scanning or, or MRI injection. I'm not even, I'm not a doctor, I'm not sure. But those actual devices were encrypted and impacted by ransomware. You know, people have wirelessly connected pacemakers, which why would you do that? But I understand in order to manage those devices, that might make it easier for the management team. But imagine if somebody, you know, encrypts somebody's pacemaker or threatens to. That's definitely a, a serious concern moving forward. Let's talk more about the WannaCry. This is something that hit the news. Basically, everybody went home Friday, you know, went to enjoy the weekend. And over the weekend, this thing stormed through what seemed to be everywhere. And everybody on Monday, you know, all, all systems alert, run Windows update, run all the update files you can. Right, batten down the hatches. Exactly. Yeah. So how did this all start? We started seeing reports coming in late Friday morning last week. You know, it was just a couple of tweets on, on Twitter talking about it. And then I'm like, all right, what's going on? There's, there's something because more and more people are talking about it. Before we knew anything, we were hearing uh, reports that 16 hospitals in the, in the UK had been hit with this ransomware variant. Telecommunications company out of Spain was hit. And we're hearing all these reports coming in from other countries about this ransomware. And then as soon as some of the researchers started weighing in on it, they realized that this was spreading so quickly. Actually, it was the most quickly spreading ransomware variant that anyone's seen so far because whoever had coded it had done so to exploit the SMB1 vulnerability, which is a vulnerability within Microsoft that was announced, I believe, in March and patched in March. Microsoft rolled out a patch for that. Apparently, a lot of people did not apply that patch or update. This was linked to uh, an exploit the NSA uh, reportedly used called Eternal Blue. And uh, they supposedly used that to, you know, target enemies of the country and, and try and see what they were talking about. Eventually, Microsoft discovered this vulnerability or found out about it, did what they could to patch it, but a lot of people just were behind in their patching. We haven't heard that many reports of victims impacted in the United States. People are still trying to figure out why that is. 
but there were reports of 150 countries got impacted. Some of the numbers were, I believe, wildly inflated coming out initially because people just were trying to gather as much information as it came in, and, and some people got it wrong. But that was a, a very busy uh, weekend. Um, I was monitoring that all through Friday night till 2 in the morning. I'm sending alert emails out to my team and my boss and conference calls first thing Saturday morning to discuss it and everything like that. So, yeah, it was it was uh, hair raising, to say the least. So your team was on top of it the second the report started coming out Friday morning, started monitoring it, saw it build up and you just followed through. Yeah, we issued an alert to our membership right away on Friday. We knew that this was going to be big. So as soon as we gathered enough information that we felt confident about, we sent out an email to all of the NJ Kick membership to make them aware of it. We've gotten reports back that because we did send out that alert, it prompted people to take action right away, and they were not impacted. So, so most people nowadays are running an antivirus, you know, and their they, Windows update is set to automatic. This sounds very sensational, going through and infecting computers and pacemakers and everything. Is it really as bad as it sounds, or can I rely on my antivirus? Can I just fall back on, you know, my organization? No, not really. Um, I mean, as a member of an organization, if you don't have any kind of control over, uh, you know, IT administration, there's very little you can do. With the exception of making sure the user account that you use to log on to your system has restricted privileges. One of the things that ransomware variants often take advantage of are elevated privileges or administrator access on user accounts. And unfortunately, this is a big problem, and I think a lot of IT teams really need to sit down and, and seriously audit all of their users and see who's allowed access to what. If you have restricted access, that might stop some infections in their tracks. Antivirus, of course, I encourage everyone to run, you know, fully updated, a, a good, reputable antivirus software. That won't catch all of them because they're signature-based, and if there's a new variant out that nobody has any kind of signature to, it, it's not going to show up in any database. There's nothing to compare it to. It's not going to be detected until it's too late. Other considerations include making sure that ports on your network and system that are not necessary are closed and disabled. And the reason why I say that is that over the past year, we've seen an increasing number of, of New Jersey-based victims that got hit with ransomware through remote desktop protocol compromise. Remote desktop is a Microsoft-specific application that allows one user to connect to another computer remotely. And a lot of times these hackers will scan for open ports that are associated with common remote desktop uh, software and they will brute force it and get their way in. And what I mean by brute force is they'll compare password lists that they have against what's being used on the, on the server and see if there's you know, weak or default credentials being used. And they'll be able to get in that way. And it's super simple and super quick to crack passwords. I don't think people understand how easy it is uh, to crack passwords, especially now the computer systems have so much processing power than they did previously. So it, it takes a matter of seconds. What used to take days takes, you know, seconds or minutes to do. And they'll get in on a server and deploy ransomware manually through the network. They'll kind of map the network out, figure out where the most important files are, and they'll deploy the ransomware manually. So for system administrators, lock down your systems, close off ports you're not using, shut down services you're not using. Absolutely. For end users, have robust, strong passwords. Yes. You know, have a good password policy in place. Is there any other good information we can give out I'd say for people? Even, even for, you know, end users or, or home users, you know, have two accounts running. Have your own administrator account. So if you want to install software or do any kind of administrative tasks on your own system, you use that account. But for everything else, your email checking, your web surfing, your Facebook posting, you use a restricted privileged account. In addition, mobile devices. Now, I said Android is increasingly being targeted. Big problem with Android is that a lot of people will seek out applications from other sources other than the official Google Play Store. A lot of times those apps are malicious in nature. They could be stealing your data, especially you know bank account logins and the like. They could deploy ransomware. Uh, make sure to run antivirus on your Android. Keep that operating system up to date as well as all your applications up to date as well. It's good advice. Thank you again, Krista, for coming onto the show and discussing ransomware. Hopefully the problem gets less, but somehow I figure that uh, once that problem is solved, something else, another whack-a-mole will come up. Exactly. You know, the uh, internal game of cat and mouse between security and hacking. So thank you again for coming on to the show. It's always been a pleasure. All right, thank so, you for having me. That's it for this week's podcast. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to send us an email to podcast at tech.nj.gov. 
For TechNJ, I'm John Silvestri. Thanks for listening.